الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي القديم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي ذكره شرف للذاكرين وشكره فوز للشاكرين وطاعته نجاة للمطيعين ثم الصلاة والسلام التحية والإكرام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وخاتم النبيين وحبيب إله العالمين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا الرسول الأمجد المحمود الأحمد رحمة للقالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد أدو على تمام عدة المرسلين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المقسومين وأصحابه المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا ومولانا وإمام زماننا الحجة المنتظر المهدي عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف الله ولعنة الدائمة الباقية على أعدائهم أجمعين من أول يوم ظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام على من جعل الله الشفاء في تربته السلام على من الإجابة تحت قبته السلام على ساكن كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم وقرآنه المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم أعهد إنكم يا بني آدم ألا تعبدوا الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين وأن عبدوني هذا سرات مستقيم أمنا بالله وصدق الله العلي العظيم زينوا مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد As the days go by, I realize I've been missing points every single day and the time goes by so fast Yesterday we spoke about um, the beauty and the importance of the Holy Qur'an and the primacy of the Holy Qur'an in all of our lives such that it is a letter from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for mankind and it provides us with all of our answers. Yet we are, in the day of judgment, Rasulullah will complain that we have abandoned this holy book. And how can the Shia not be somebody who recites Qur'an when we are told in the maqtal that Imam al Hussein's blessed head when it was severed and upon a spear, it would still recite verses of Holy Qur'an. You've all heard the Nawha, Surah Kahf is Sunata hai. Yes, sir. Kiska hai. This, this head recites Surah Al Kahf. Whose head is this? Mashallah. How can a Shia not be somebody who recites Quran when in the Ziyar we say, Assalamu alaikum ya Sharik al Quran? We say, Imam al Zaman is the partner of the Holy Quran. If he is the partner of the Quran and we have no relationship with the Quran, with what respect do we call ourselves the Shia of Imam Zaman? How can we say we're preparing ourselves for the coming of the Imam of the time if we have no relationship with the Qur'an whatsoever? And I spoke about the most important hadith in our scripture being the hadith of Thaqalain. My dear brothers and sisters and elders, if there is one hadith you need to hold on to, it is Thaqalain. It is enough as a, something that you have to live your life by. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He 
He says that I leave behind two weighty things, the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. If you, do, if, you do, if you hold on to both of these things, you will never go astray. Wallah, that is all you need for your lives, to hold on to these two things, the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. And I spoke yesterday about the importance of holding on to these two things and not giving in to the things that the West gives us. Not giving on to the things that the West tries to tempt us with. Because we are better, we know our purpose in life, we know what fulfills the needs inside. And it is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I, we closed our discussion yesterday with a small thematic exegesis or a thematic look at the word ahad, covenant or promise. We spoke about the importance of a man of iman, faith, being somebody who returns the amana and being somebody who is trustworthy, ameen. But we spoke about how while we, our, in our social lives we have many promises between each other, between us and our business partners, between us and the government. There is an important promise that Allah has innately put within our conscience. And this is the promise between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we will serve him. That we will not serve the shaitan. And attached to this is the fact that we will hold on to the wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt. We spoke about how we have dua al-ahad. Where we renew the covenant with Imam al-Mahdi every morning. This dua al-ahad, it is said, if you recite it 40 mornings in a row, you will, even if you pass away before the imam of the time, you will be brought back to life when the imam comes on his return. Because in the dua itself, we say, Oh Allah, if before the imam comes back, you, allow, you make me pass away, then, فَأَخْرِجْنِي مِنْ قَبْرِي مُعْتَزِرًا كَفَنِي With my kafan, bring me out from my qabr. شَاهِرًا سَيْفِي My sword and sheathed. Mujarwadan Qanati, Mulabbiyan Da'wat al Da'i, answering the call. So if you recite it for 40 mornings, you will be among those who are alongside the Imam of the time. For 40 mornings in a row, if you recite it. But we spoke about how these, this, there was a verse in the Quran about breaking the oath that was used by the two Sayyidas. Sayyida Fatima and Zainab al Kubra, Salawatullah wa Salamahu alayhima. Referring to how people broke the oath, the people who were at Ghadir broke the oath, the people of Kufa who wrote letters to Imam al Hussein broke that oath. And we question how are we upholding this oath with the Imam of our time? And it's upon us to make one promise at least within this 10 days, one promise to the Imam of our time, something we're going to institute in our life so that we can get closer to the Imam. Whether it be reciting at least 10 verses of Quran a day, we do that. Whether it be reading into religion just half an hour every weekend, we do that. Something that strengthens that covenant between us and the Imam of the time. Now I mentioned this verse in the Holy Quran yesterday and I recited it again in my khutbah. Surah 36 verse 60, Allah says, Alam aqahad ilaykum ya bani Adam alla ta'budush shaitan. Allah said he took a covenant with Bani Adam, with the children of Adam that they will not serve the shaitan. Now if we have taken this covenant that we're not going to serve the shaitan, it becomes extremely important for us surely to try and understand the shaitan, understand the plots of the shaitan so that we can keep away from them. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are told in the Holy Quran, has given us an explanation or the essence of everything, correct? If he has given us the essence of everything, it would have been enough for him to mention shaitan once or twice because we would have got the essence. But Allah mentions shaitan time and time again in the Holy Quran. To the extent in Surah 35, Surah Fatir, verse 6, Allah says, Inna shaitan lakum aduun. Surely shaitan is an enemy. فَاتَّخِذُوهُ adua. Therefore take him as an enemy. You'd think if Allah said he is your enemy, it was enough. But Allah thought it's so important to tell you to take him as an enemy. Why? Because we can become heedless of the fact that shaitan has an influence in our lives. We grew up in the western world. Everything has to be seen and scientifically discovered. We don't believe in a metaphysical world anymore. What's shaitan? We have to understand that shaitan has an impact in our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us this. He's warned us and he's told us, do not follow the shaitan. And he told us he is your enemy, take him as an enemy. If you have an enemy, surely you'd understand the enemy's plots. You'd understand the enemy's tricks so that you can avoid those pitfalls. It's interesting. In Sahih Futa Sajjadiyya, dua number 20, dua makarim al akhlaq, which all of us recite on Laylatul Qadr. Imam al Sajjad, salawatullah wa salamahu alayhi. He has an extremely interesting line. He says, Oh Allah, keep me alive as long as my life is a free gift of obedience towards you. Mm -hmm. When 
When my life becomes a playground for the shaitan, take me back towards you. If we recite this sincerely, how many of us would have gone back already? Ya Allah. But the interesting word I wanted to pick up was how Imam al-Sajjad said, فَإِذَا كَانَ عُمْرِي مَرْتَعًا لِلشَّيْطَانِ When my life in the translation, it says, becomes a playground for the shaitan. Shaitan treats your life like a playground. He plays with you. He messes with you. He enjoys it. Now, when you're playing a sport or you're having a battle, let's say we're playing football because I'm a football fan. You're playing football and you have the opposition. Normally, if you're being extra, what do you do? You study the opposition, you study their tactics, you see what they're going to do and you nullify them and try to defeat them. Shaitan is treating our lives like a playground. To the extent that we're told, I'll say this in a second, but Shaitan treats our life like a playground. He wants to mess around with us. He knows which buttons to press. He knows what your weaknesses are. But how do, do we know the weaknesses of the Shaitan? Do we know how to take away the threat of the Shaitan in our life? This becomes important when we look at another fundamental of our religion. And that is tawalla and tabarra. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ اللَّعْنَةَ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ He says to shaitan, surely upon you is my la'na until the day of judgment. Now we find a lot of people have an issue with this la'na, especially outside of our school. Yes? A lot of people have a problem with this la'na. Allah says the first la'in was shaitan. Now in the Quran, there's this very interesting verse. Surah Al-An'am, Surah 6, verse 112. وَجَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيًّا عَدُوًّا We made for every Nabi an enemy. Shayateen, Al-Insi wal-Jinn We made for every Prophet an enemy from among the a shaitan, from among the man and the jinn. I thought shaitan was only a jinn. Why is Allah talking about the shaitan from the man? In Surah Nas at the end, what do we say? We ask for refuge from not just jinn, from men. I thought shaitan was only a jinn. Where did this man come from? You have to understand there are shaitan, shayateen among the jinn, but there are shayateen among the men. Every prophet had a shayateen as an enemy from among the men. If you have to understand the life of Rasulullah, we have to understand who his enemies were. So that we can understand why they became enemies and we can make sure we don't go along that same line. Here, what was, this, what was the philosophy of La'na? Why were we told to do La'na? First and foremost, it was a, a way of showing our bara'a, our dissociation from these individuals. We are not people that curse and throw funny insults. We are not people who don't have dignity, that just randomly swear, show, throw insults and curse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran at least six or seven times uses the word la'na. So if Allah has used this word la'na and we find it in our traditions, we find that this is the way that we choose to do bara'a from the enemies. We do la'na. And it is a dua where we pray to Allah to remove mercy from them. Now every dua, and we'll speak about dua more tomorrow, but every dua in essence is an action plan. Many of you know, if we do a dua for a job, do we do dua for a job and then wait for somebody to come and give us a job in our houses? Or do you do dua for a job and then go seek a job? You do dua and then you do action. In the same way, if I do la'ana to Allah to remove mercy from an individual, surely my actions have to change so that I don't become like that individual. Otherwise, Allah should also remove mercy from me. Therefore, it becomes important to study the shayateen of history. So the example I like to give about why we do la'ana is you know when you go to Hajj, you have three pillars, the three shaitans, and you stone those three pillars. We're told the philosophy is what? With every stone that you throw, you're meant to pick something that is a satanic quality and throw it back at shaitan. La'ana is the verbal stoning of the shaitans of history. Meaning whenever you do la'ana, you're meant to pick one of the qualities on that individual and say la'ana, throw that stone at him to say to Allah, I don't want to become like that. Protect me from becoming like that. You know, there's an interesting narration about the day of Khadir. I mentioned the day of Khadir a lot. On the day of Khadir, there's a narration in Ihtijaj of at tabarsi a Shia book, a beautiful book of um, disputes. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He says the day of Khadir is like the day when Allah told the angels to bow down to Adam. The angels, when they were told to bow down to Adam, it wasn't that Adam was new for them. In Hayat al-Qulub, Allah Majlisi says, Allah created the form of Adam, 
and left it at the gate of Jannah for about 2,000 years, the angels saw Adam. They saw what he was like and they wondered why has Allah created this body? And the same way through Rasulullah's Khilafah, Ali ibn Abi Talib was seen by every single individual. Everyone could see his qualities, everyone could see his personality. Then Allah breathed the ruh in the, uh, into Adam and he told the angels, bow down to Adam. One man said no, who was? Shaytan. Rasulullah says, those who refuse the bay'ah of Ali on Khadir are like Shaytan who refused to bow down to Adam. I tell you with haqq, the Shaytan who refused to bow down to, the, to Adam, he was okay. At least he was open. The Shaytan on the Khadir was the first to congratulate Ali ibn Abi Talib. But it just like Shaytan said, I'm going to misguide all of them. He succeeded in misguiding this entire ummah. The Shaytan on Ghadir was worse than the Shaytan that, that refused the Baban of Adam. And it becomes important to study Shaytan. Why? Because we spoke about fulfilling the covenant, the promise. The Shaytan has misguided many before us. How many of you know Shimr ibn Dil Joshan? He was fighting alongside Ali ibn Abi Talib at Siffin. How many of you know that? At Siffin, Shimr was with Ali. At Naharwan, he was against Ali. At Naharwan, not only was he against Ali, when they captured him, they put him in ropes. He came to Imam al Hussein and said, These ropes are very tight. Can you ask your father to loosen them for me? Hussein goes to his father and says, Oh, my father, he's asking me, what do I do? Ali says, If you wish, you can loosen the ropes. He loosens the ropes from Shimmer that day, and another day Shimmer is sitting on his chest. What happened? You know, after Khadir, when they came to attack the house of Fatima, Imam Amir al Mu'minin had told, If 40 of you come with your head shaven, we'll fight. Four people came. Some narrations say five Salman, Abu Dharr, Miqdad, Zubair ibn al Awwa. At Jamal, where was Zubair? On the other side. What happened? A lover of Ali and Fatima protecting the house after Khadir. One of four or five individuals, Zubair. He was against Ali at Jama. What happened? We have to study these individuals. Study the plots of the shaitan. So that we can keep away from them. If we are to, re- if we are to get to the reality of la'na, of dissociation, this is how we must do it. La'na wasn't a cultish practice where we're just letting out some form of venom or adrenaline. La'ana was a spiritual practice, it was a du'a where you connect to Allah and try to remove injustice from your individual self, purify yourself. That was la'ana. Now in this lecture, it will be very difficult to cover everything about shaitan. Indeed, we can do a series on shaitan, the shaitan himself, the shaitans of history, the shaitans of today, how we should be interacting in society. But today all I wanted to do was introduce you to the shaitan according to the Qur'an and give you a few practical tips so that at least we can become better spiritual individuals connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with your permission I will do this after you recite as ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The first thing, in the Qur'an there's an interesting verse in Surah Al-Araf, Surah number 7, verse 17. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants respite to shaitan, shaitan says, فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي لَأَكُعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ سَرَاتَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Because you've allowed me to go astray, Ya Allah, I'm going to sit for them on sirat al-mustaqeem. First point, where is shaitan? He is at sirat al-mustaqeem. He's not in the pub. He's not needed there. They're gone. He's here. He's sitting with you right now trying to misguide you. Shaitan sits on Sirat al Mustaqim. Summa atiyanahum men baina edihim, men khalfihim, wana imanihim, wan shema elihim, wala tajidu akhtarahum shakirin. Then I will come at them from before them, and from behind them, and from the right, and from the left, and you will not find most of them to be thankful. Here Shaitan says, I will cover them from all sides. Now, what does it mean when Shaitan, what does Shaitan mean when he will cover us from all sides? Does it mean he'll come at us from all sides? First, understand what Shaitan is. Shaitan refers to a group of individuals. There is the head shaitan who is Iblis. Shaitan refers to a group of individuals among the jinn who are, who are devils who want to misguide individuals. So it's not just one person, it's many people. Such that Rasulullah says everyone has their own individual shaitan. That was, that's what I was about to mention. 
Everyone has their own individual shaitan. He grows up with you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows you're a person of bad temper, so he's going to click that button. He knows this person can't control his lust, so he's going to click that button. He knows this person doesn't know how to speak properly. He's going to click that button. He knows you. He's grown up with you. Rasulullah says everyone has their own shaitan. So does Rasulullah have his own shaitan? He says yes, but because of the purity of my character, my shaitan became Muslim. So shaitan, everyone has their own shaitan. And shaitan surrounds you from all sides. There's a narration, a beautiful narration found in every single one of our tafsir works. And in fact, even in the tafsir works of our brothers. From Imam al-Baqir salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. Where he explains what the shaitan means when he says he's going to come at us from all sides. Number one, he says he's going to come at us from before us. Imam al-Baqir says this means he's going to make He's going to make the matter of the akhirah seem a very simple affair. He's going to lower the importance of akhirah. Now we know in our usul al-deen, one of the most important things, one of the five usul is akhirah. The belief in a hereafter. And this is something our western counterparts, our atheists, they say doesn't exist. Correct? They like a life without any accountability. If you find in the Quran when it talks about Akhira, this is one of the things the, the Jahiliya people could not stand. They hated the idea of Akhira. Why? Because they had to be accountable for their deeds. They didn't want to be accountable for their deeds. First action point, make sure you're always accounting for your deeds. And don't think anything is too small. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Luqman, Surah 31, He recounts Luqman saying to his son, Ya Bunaya innaha intaku mithqala habbatim min khardalin. Oh my son, even if it is the weight of a mustard seed and it is in the highest heavens or in the lowest earth, Allah will bring it out on the day of judgment. Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi, who's written a masaib as well, he's written a book, a beautiful book, Manazul al-Akhara, Journey to the Afterlife. I recommend all of you to read it. It's a brilliant book. He narrates a story in there from a Hawza student who had a teacher that, he beloved, he, that was very beloved to him. The teacher passed away, and the sheikh says, I really wanted to see my teacher again. So he did some a'amal, and he wanted to see his teacher. A year after his teacher has passed away, he saw his teacher in his dream. He said to his teacher, tell me about the matter of that, that life. The teacher said, there was one day I was traveling. I was traveling through Syria. And there was some hay there on the journey in Baba Saghir. There was some hay. He says, this hay obviously didn't be belong to me, but I was very hungry, so I took one. Khasbi, I took one. It wasn't belonging to me. He says, to be honest, I can't even remember if I ate it now or if I just threw it away. But because it was a matter of ghasb, and it was, even though it was small, small, for this entire year in the grave, I've been being punished. For taking one little bit of hay that was not mine. Even if it is as small as a mustard seed. What does Allah say in Surah Zilzal? Even if, it is, if, it, if anyone does an atom's weight of good, he will see it. If anyone does an atom's weight of evil, he will also see it. Never stop accounting for yourself. Because shaitan is going to make the amr of the akhirah seem very simple. But here we must also understand that the journey of the Akhirah is not something light. It should be something that's always before our eyes. You know, sometimes we forget that heaven is extremely beautiful. It's not something simple. And hell is extremely difficult. You know, in our, our movie, sometimes they, they give us this phrase that some people use. See you in hell. Do you think hell's a joke that you can just say to someone, see you in hell? You know, some of the children, I tell them sometimes, ah, oh, you've done a sin, you're going to be punished. I'm going to have to go to hell for a year. It's not a joke. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, Surah 4, verse 56. كُلَّمَا نَذِدَتْ جُلُودُهُمْ بَدَّلْنَاهُمْ جُلُودَهَا لِيَذُوقُ الْعَذَابِ We will burn their skins, and every time we have burnt it thoroughly, we will replace their skins with new skins so that we can burn them again thoroughly, so that they can taste the punishment. We will burn them, we will burn them. And when they burn thoroughly, we will replace the skin and burn them again. You thought hell was easy? But at the same time, Allah describes the beauty of heaven. In Surah Zukhra, Surah 43, he says, There is what delights the soul and is tasteful towards the eyes. There is every beauty you can imagine. And Allah says he has more. In Surah 50, verse 35, Allah says, They will have whatever they want therein. 
وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيد And we still have more The beauties of heaven are there They're better than the beauties of this world And the badness of hell is there It is worse than everything in this world There's a beautiful narration from Imam Al-Hassan Salawatullah Allah wa salamahu alayhi Imam al Hassan during the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen's Khilafah, he used to live an okay life. Amir al-Mu'mineen used to live a very simple life because he was a caliph and he wanted to equate himself with the poorest. Imam al Hassan used to live an okay life. He used to live a nice life. People used to look at him and see he's doing well. A Jew comes to him one day and says, Oh, Ya ibn Rasulullah, you're belying your grandfather. Imam al Hassan said, what do you mean? He says, you are a believer. Your grandfather said, this world is a prison for the believer. This world is a prison for the believer. And the afterlife is the heaven for the believer. And this world is the God and the heaven for the unbeliever. And the afterlife is the hell for the unbeliever. He says, this looks like it's twisted. I am a poor Jewish man, a disbeliever. And look at my life. I have nothing. I'm destitute. I'm poor. While you are a believer and look, your life looks quite comfortable. Imam al-Hassan smiled. He said to him, oh, but disbeliever, had you understand how beautiful heaven was, you would realize if I was given everything in this world, more than the pleasures that I have right now, it would still not equate to the beauties of heaven. And oh, disbeliever, if you think your life is bad, had you understood how bad hell was, no matter how bad this life got, you would understand hell is still worse. Therefore, even if you're suffering right now, this suffering is still a garden for you. And even if I am having pleasure right now, it's still a prison for me because heaven will set me free. That's the beauty of heaven and the difficulty of hell. This difficulty of hell is something we find the Ahlul Bayt cried about. In Dua Abi Hamza Thumali, you've all recited Laylatul Qadr. What does Imam Al Sajjad Alihi Afdul Salati Wasalam say? Sallu ala He says, Abki li dhulmat qabri. أبكي لضيق لحتي أبكي لسؤال منكر ونكير إياي أبكي لخروجي من قبري عريانا ذليلا حاملا ثقلي على ظهري أنظر مرة عن يميني وأخرى عن شمالي إذ الخلائق كلهم في شأن خير شأني He says I cry for the darkness of my grave I die for the, I cry for the narrowness of that house. I cry for the questioning of Munkar and Nakir upon me. I cry for the taking out of my soul from my body. There's a narration that when your soul is taken out, it's like somebody is pulling at your flesh from all sides. The Imam says, I cry for when my body will be taken out of the grave in a state of nakedness, carrying its load on its back. I will look to my right and I will look to my left and everyone will be suffering in their own way. In Surah Al-Qara'ah, what does it say? يَوْمَ تَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَلْعَهِنَ الْمَنْفُوشِ الْقَارِعَ مَا الْقَارِعَ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَ يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْثُوثِ And that day that people will be like scattering moths. But, you know, these little moths that are flying everywhere. Everyone will be going in their own directions. These are difficult things. Never forget this. Keep this in front of you. Shaytan, one of his plots is to make Akhirah seem very simple. It doesn't always exist. Why do you have to worry about the Akhirah? YOLO, you only live once. Enjoy life. We say, yes, YOLO, you only live once. Live the right life. Don't ruin your life. Shaytan wants to ruin your life. He'll make Akhirah seem very simple. There's one more interpretation of it, but it will come on another day. Then Shaytan says he'll come at you from behind you. According to Imam al-Baqir, this means he will make you stingy and he will make you amass wealth and property without giving anything in charity. Here, I think it suffices to quote one narration of Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam who He says, I feel sorry for the person who is stingy. I feel sorry for the person who is stingy. In his life, he doesn't benefit from his own money. After his life, everyone else benefits from his money. When he's in the grave, he still won't benefit from his money. Why? Because he's dead and he never used any of it. But everyone who he stopped from using it in his life will now use his money. Some of it will go in charity, some of it his family will use. But he, stopped, he didn't use it himself. He didn't enjoy his own money. And in the grave, he won't enjoy his own money. And everyone who he stopped from using his own money now uses his money. 
He says, I feel sorry for this person. What sort of a person is this? Bakhil, stingy. We are told to give charity freely such that your right hand should not know what your left hand is giving in charity. It is highly recommended to give charity every Thursday night and every Friday. Make it a habit, even if it is a small amount, give charity every week. For this is something the shaitan surely hates. He can't stand it when you give charity. Such that our imams say, whenever you're about to give charity, shaitan comes to you and says, delay it. One of the biggest plots of the shaitan is whenever you're about to give charity, he tells you just delay it a little bit. And you know, Asians, when we delay something five minutes, it takes at least five days, yes? Shaitan's biggest plot is to make you delay your charity. Give a small amount, one pound every week. But give weekly. Make it a habit. Because our Ahlul Bayt were people who were frequent in their charity. Then when Shaitan says he will come at you from the right, what does it mean? Afsidu alayhim amru dinihim. He will corrupt the matters of their religion. And he will increase shubuhat. He will increase their doubts in religion. Now there are many different types of doubts in Islam. Shubuhat is a specific doubt which is named obscurity. Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu wa sallamuhu alayhi. In Nahjul Balagh, a sermon about 37, he says that Shubuhat was named such because it, it resembles truth. Shubuhat comes from the word Tashbih, Tashbih, you know, something which is similar. He says Shubuhat is a doubt which resembles truth. And we know because of Facebook and WhatsApp, how many times people send you things which are completely off, look like they're truth, and they'll back it up, they'll give you a Quranic verse or a hadith, and they say, look, this is the matter. A little key here, if somebody gives you a view, gang gives you a Qur'anic verse, that's probably going to be his opinion. If somebody gives you a Qur'anic verse, then gives you a view, that's probably going to be truth. Because he based it on the Qur'an, he didn't base the Qur'an on his opinion. One matter I tell to you, if you hear a lot of what I say, it's Qur'an, Hadith, Hadith, Qur'an, Qur'an, Hadith, Hadith, Qur'an. Because I'm nobody to say anything. I'm here to serve Mawla and to tell you what Mawla said, that's it. Yaqeen is when you read what the Thaqalain said and you sit on that. Amir al-Mu'mineen says when shubuhat come, when a matter comes to a believer and he's not sure about it, it resembles truth, it seems like it might be true but he's not sure, he falls back on yaqeen, he falls back on conviction. If you have no conviction to start with, then how are you going to do this? Therefore it becomes important to read into your religion, study your religion. Small amounts, there's so much out there now on the internet, lectures, books, you need any recommendations? Please come, I'll give you recommendations. There's so many books out there. There's no excuse. A hundred years ago, there was no internet. They'd have to go to libraries and read books. Sometimes the book print wasn't nice. Now you have your phones, iTablets, iKindle, iPads. There's no excuses. One hour a week. Is that too much? One hour a week. I read a study a little while ago that said if... if um, People stopped using Facebook. They could read the equivalent of 20 books a week if they stopped using Facebook. You know, every time we um, wake up, what's the first thing we do? We look at our phones. We're distracted. Shaitan will come. And that phone is where you normally get your trouble heart from. A WhatsApp message or a Facebook post. This is a new theory from this marja or this scholar. Fall back on conviction. Modern shaitan. Fall back on conviction. The modern shaitan, truly. Allah. Shaitan will come and he will increase shubuhat in your religion. And he will also make dhalala, he will make deviation seem beautiful. But if you have yaqeen, if you strengthen that, that connection to Ahlul Bayt, never will you go astray. This is something I should, I should probably say here. I've said this before in another center. The people of yes, our, our forefathers... Their yaqeen came from a strong spiritual and emotional connection to Ahlul Bayt. The more modern, modern believers, we need a lot more kind of theory nowadays. We need a lot more explanations. We don't establish a spiritual emotional connection with Ahlul Bayt as much. My dear brothers and sisters, when I told you yesterday about the dhikr of Hussein being like the dhikr of Allah and you holding on to it, it's because there are times in your life where things will get so confusing or things can be really difficult. You'll be in a difficult circumstance, family's not going well, you don't have money, you're not comfortable. At that time, no theory in the world can help you. But an emotional connection might still hold you on. There are times you need that emotional connection to say the shuhada. You know, I remember my friends went to Calais. You know Calais when they had all the refugees there? My friends went to Calais. 
They met some people from Kuwait. They turned out to be Shia. My friend said to him, what do you need? We'll come and bring it for you. He says the Kuwaiti gripped him and whispered something in his ear. He said, two years we've been running away from our homes. We haven't had a dhikr of Hussein. Just bring us a dhikr of Abba Abdullah. <laughs> Refugees. They said, for two years we'd had no dhikr. Bring us just a majlis. We haven't had any dhikr. My friend said to me, you know, we brought the Moors. You should have seen them break down when they saw a Moor for the first time in two years. They broke down when they see a turba. We throw the turba on the floor, walk off. They broke down when they saw the turba. You need an emotional connection. It will hold you on to the religion when things get difficult. Shaitan will try to corrupt your religion. Have yaqeen so that you can hold on to that religion. The last one, Shaitan says, will come at you from the left. Meaning what? Meaning he will make desires seem very beautiful to you. He will make the world seem beautiful. The desires of this world, the shahawat, the passions. How many times we love to have dessert, shisha, go out, have a lot of things to enjoy. Our Ahlul Bayt have told us sometimes try to just hold back a little bit. You can enjoy, but just enjoy to a limit. Have some limits. I like to give the example because I love, I love biscuits with my tea, I'll be honest. And you know, I used to have five biscuits. And then I thought, you know what, let me just limit it to two. You know, the first time you do that, it seems really difficult. You know, you, you stop at two and you're like... I kind of feel that third one, I've got space. 20 minutes later, you don't even care. The Ahlul Bayt, Imam Al Qadim, he says, In order to strengthen your willpower and your resolve, sometimes stop doing that which is allowed because it will strengthen you in that which is haram. We see this, Allah wants us to do this. When? The month of Ramadan. He says, stop yourself from eating so that you can connect to that spiritual self of, you, of yours. Hold back sometimes from your desires. Enjoy. Have your cake, but have one piece instead of two. Don't overdo it. You know, overeating is also linked to the hardness of the heart. So especially in the month of Muharram, when we want to cry and we want to have soft hearts, try and eat a little bit less. You'll find every spiritual wayfarer, every urafa, said that the path to knowledge starts with a little bit of hunger. You must be hungry for knowledge. And Allah has connected the body to the soul. A little bit of hunger is good to make you hungry for more of a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. In all of this, the angels then come to Allah and they say, Ya Allah, you've made it very difficult for the believer. You've allowed shaitan to come at him from all sides. Allah said, oh, my dear angels, shaitan has missed out two sides. When my believer goes down to me in sujood, or he lifts his hands up to me in dua, I forgive all of his sins. Goes down to me or up to me. Shaitan left those two directions empty. Therefore, we must go back to worship, the beauty of worship. Now, before I finish, with the small time I have left, there was another thing I really wanted to say. Shaitan... One of the biggest things he does is he makes our sins seem very light. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ladina amanu la shaytan. Do not follow the footsteps of the shaytan. The scholars say, why does Allah say the footsteps? Why doesn't it just say, just don't follow the shaytan? Because the scholars say, shaytan is, doesn't come and just misguide you in one day. He takes his time. I'll give you the example I've been giving over the last few nights. Swear words. You know, when you first hear a swear word, it hurts you. It, it hits, it's not right, it doesn't feel right. As you start to hear swearing more, Shaitan tells you, look, everyone's doing it. It's not a big sin, it's a small sin, everyone does it. First thing that happens is you think of the sin as being small, you don't mind it anymore. You become accustomed to it. Then slowly, slowly what happens is time becomes difficult, you become angry, you swear. The first time you swear, you think, oh my gosh, this is weird. Shaitan comes and says, don't worry, you did it once. It's not a big deal, don't worry about it. Small sin. We say this sometimes, you know, small sin. I have bigger sins. Slowly, slowly, this individual, because it's a small sin, he starts doing it time and time again. It becomes habitual. Because shaitan said it was small, it was a small sin. Don't worry about it. The biggest thing shaitan says, he says he makes your sin small and he makes your good deeds big. How many times have you seen a person when he recites Salat or Layl or he does some good action, he thinks, I'm one of the best people in the world. I don't need to worry. My sins are all ma'af, all forgive. Don't worry about it. 
in the du'as of Ahlul Bayt and Sahifat al sajjadiya Imam al-Sajjad constantly said, Ya Allah, grant me istiqlal al-khayr, wa in kathura min qawli wa fa'li. Grant me the lessening of my good deeds, even if they be great in number. Wa istikthar al-shar, and make my sins seem very, diff- very bad, even if they're very small in number. And Imam al-Sajjad says something extremely amazing, Dua 16 of Sahifat al sajjadiya He says, Ya Allah, even if I was to cry to you until my eyelashes fell off, and even if I was to wail to you until I lost my voice, and even if I was to stand before you until my feet swell, and even if I was to do rukub to you before, until my backbone fell out of joint, if I was to do sujood to you until my eyeballs fell out, if out of humility I was only to drink the water of ashes and eat the dust of the earth, and I was never to look up to the sky out of shame, if I was to do all of this, I would not deserve the forgiveness of one of my sins. How many? One. And yet Allah is the one who says, So a 39 verse 53, Tell the believing servant who has committed israf, he has excessively done bad deeds. Never despair of Allah's mercy. We, when we do a sin, we think it's a small de- deal. That's why Amir السلام, says, don't ever think of a sin as small. Look at the one who you're disobeying. Shaitan is one of his biggest plots. Is your sins are nothing. They're okay. Don't worry about them. Allah's mercy is always bigger. Allah's mercy is bigger as long as you're not complacent about it. Allah's mercy is always bigger as long as you're not complacent. You have to be humble. And today we remember that individual that brought Imam al Hussein to Karbala. And yet Imam al Hussein's forgiveness was there for him. Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi and Kufa turned Imam al Hussein towards Karbala. At that time, Imam al Hussein said something amazing. He said, May your mother cry over you, O Hur. What does Hur respond? That saves him. It was this response that saved him. He said, Had your mother been anyone other than Fatima, I would have said the same about you. But what can I do when your mother is Fatima? He was awakening something inside him. My mother is Fatima. Why are you doing this to me and listening to them? Hur doesn't seem to know before the night of Muharram that anything is going to happen. Then on the night of the night of Muharram, after the water has been cut off, um, a decision he disagreed with, he hears the cries of Al-Atash. He goes to Umar ibn Sa'ad and he says, Oh, Umar ibn Sa'ad, are we going to fight them tomorrow? Umar says, Hur, fight? Heads are going to be flying tomorrow. Hur comes back to his companion and he says, have you watered the horse? He says, indeed, the horse is thirsty, I've watered the horse. At that point in time, Hur became very heran. He became very, you know, in a state of reflection. He was very confused, he was very weak. The companion said to him, oh Hur, you're the strongest soldier I have ever seen. Why do I see you in such a state? He said, I was reflecting, you're giving water to this horse and I can hear the grandchildren of Rasulullah crying out for their thirst. He says, I now see myself between al jannati wa nar I see myself between heaven and hell, and far be me from taking the path of hell. He with his son, and some people say his servant, he says, let us go to Imam al Hussein and ask for forgiveness. As they were going, he said, I am a man in shame. Blindfold me and rope my hands together like I'm a prisoner, for surely I am ashamed to go to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. He approaches the camp of Hussein and they see him. Hussein says, our guest is here, call him forward. Our guest has come, call him. Hur comes and says, oh my master Hussein, I'm the one who's brought you here. I'm very ashamed before you, will you grant me forgiveness? Imam al Hussein doesn't, he, he doesn't hesitate, he says, oh Hur, you are granted your forgiveness. Hur says, can I be one of the first to fight alongside you, ya Abu Abdullah? He goes out, he says some words of poetry and begins to fight. As the soldiers found it very difficult to fight him, they ganged up on him from all sides and they took him down to the ground. Blood was gushing from the face of Hur. Imam al Hussein comes to Hur and he wipes the blood and says, you are Hur, you are free as your mother named you. You are my brother in this world and the hereafter. Shortly after Hur passed away, I'd like to tell you this one story. Imam al Hussein went to pray his salat. And there was a companion there named Sa'id ibn Abdullah Hanafi and Duhair ibn al-Qayn who also came back to Imam al Hussein. He said to them, they, they said to Imam al Hussein, while you pray, they're going to shoot arrows. We will stand here and defend you. 
Imam Al Hussein stood in salat and the maqtal say, as he stood in salat, arrows started coming from all sides. Saeed would at one point be at one side defending from one arrow, then he would go to another side defending him from another arrow. As Imam Al Hussein went into sujood and an arrow came from above, Saeed would stand tall and make sure the arrow never touched Aba Abdullah. At the end of Aba Abdullah's salat, Saeed was fully covered with arrows. He turns back to his mawla and he says, Hussein, are you satisfied, oh Hussein? Have I committed, completed my due? Imam Al Hussein says, indeed you have. Having heard this, Saeed falls straight to the floor and passes away as a martyr. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.